Uh, okay, so I'll just say a few things about myself. So I've worked in uh, Manchester City Council for over two decades, uh, and uh, for the vast majority of that time around ageing, I was the person in the office when they needed somebody to write a report about older people, and everybody else kind of shuffled their papers, you know, and looked away. I said, yeah, this is the thing to do. And many, many years later, I now kind of uh, really, it's the thing I like doing, it's the thing I do, I guess, with my time. So. This just gives you an idea of the numbers and percentages. I don't know if you have, well, you can see it, of older people, uh, or over 65, this is in, in GM. And the point here, I guess, uh, is the diversity of ageing populations across uh, Greater Manchester. So in the city of Manchester, we have something like 9.5% of people are aged over 65. I think the national average is around about 17%, isn't it? And whereas in Wigan, you have a lot higher numbers of older people. And this, again, relating back to the points that Tina and Chris have made, kind of gives us a different, it implies different approaches need to be taken in different areas. So we're sat now in Ordwick in central Manchester, which has relatively low numbers of older people. Uh, it lives in, a, in an area where you've got high population churn, population change. Your next door neighbour may, ch may change every six months, 12 months, and you have relatively low numbers of older people as well. Uh, so you have a situation in which the social networks, the services and so on, which may be typical in areas where you've got high numbers of older people and that shared experience of ageing is completely different in some of those inner city areas. Um, so that's something to bear in mind in terms of this work and it's certainly driven the work we've been doing in Manchester. Now, this was, Chris um, uh, mentioned in his slide the um, uh, people between 50 and state pension age, I think it was, of 65, who are out of work or under work. Now, I've got a graph to demonstrate this, uh, a map rather to demonstrate this. So, uh, uh, and what you see here, it's, a pretty, it's pretty difficult to tell, but the darker areas are where you've got the higher levels of people between 50 and state pension age who are out of work. Now you can probably look at, you can probably find your bit of the map and it probably doesn't come as any surprise uh, where those concentrations are. And certainly one of the pieces of work which I'll, I'll, I'll mention later in the presentation is about trying to address some of this. But it seems to me and it seems to us that um, if we're unable to find uh, solutions, pathways, approaches for these this midlife cohort uh, as, and think about that as part of our programme, then the inequalities in health, uh, well-being and isolation that uh, Tina demonstrated will continue uh, into later life for some of these groups. Now the age-friendly city model, I, I guess most of you are aware of this by now from what you described, but I just want to say two or three things about it. This was a program, a research program originally launched by the World Health Organization, I think 2006, 2007. Uh, and it operated across, I think, 32 or 33 cities uh, internationally, right from the poorest uh, cities through to some of the richest. And they published a document in 2007, uh, which again you may have seen, uh, which organised um, the different domains of the age-friendly city into these eight domains and the intersection of them creates the age-friendly city. And around about in the late 2000s in Manchester we were trying to find a way in which to articulate our programme and like many of you I'm sure the day-to-day -day language of ageing it tends to be negative, it tends to focus on deficit and there isn't really, there hasn't really been a positive way to try and describe what we're trying to achieve. Certainly, I, I guess in the late 2000s, there was the lifetime neighbourhoods idea. We were quite taken with that. Um, but we thought this was more helpful in trying to describe and give a kind of uh, ambition, I suppose, to what we were involved in. So we, we, we picked up this idea and kind of ran with it in Manchester. And alongside that, we tried also, I think, to try and describe um, what our programme was in relationship to other narratives of ageing. And we came up with this slide. <clears throat> so on the left-hand side, you've got, if you like, the medical or biomedical narrative of ageing. And at its best, 
um, it tries to see the whole health and social care system as being something which is important to reorganise. Very much about the prevention of entry into hospitals and commissioning for the frail elderly. Uh, elderly. And then if we move rightwards into the kind of social care world, which again many many ageing programmes, or the majority of ageing programmes for the last 20 years certainly that I've been involved in, have been led from the care sector and have this kind of care perspective. And again we use, we see this kind of language, uh, so it's certainly in Manchester older people have been described as customers, um, that there's a focus on the individual family and informal networks. And again at best we describe things in terms of a whole system working. Now again, we think for again, the reasons that you've heard uh, in the two previous presentations, it's just, this didn't capture what we were involved in doing. This is one, wasn't our game, if you like. We wanted to do something that was about what's in the right-hand column, uh, which we described as, I suppose, a citizenship model to ageing. So older people are social actors. They have rights to the city. Um, they're citizens, that our work focuses on the neighbourhood and on the city because decisions taken at the city level and the way that the city is organised and the obvious example is transport systems actually has a significant impact on how older people live uh, their lives and that we're about promoting social capital and participation. We're not just about keeping the ageing agenda within the health and social care family, we're actually about challenging all the other services, universal services, to make sure that they address the issues of ageing. And by and large, they don't. Even after uh, 15 years of doing this work, it's always a kind of constant argument and struggle to get this stuff mainstreamed. I'm just going to zip on <coughs> to this one. This was one uh, we made earlier, I should say. So this is one that uh, colleagues from Southway Housing, working with Manchester School of Architecture and Manchester University did. And you, you may have seen this before. Um, it's, uh, again, you can access this online. I've got a little book um, uh, which will we'll, we'll circulate, which has some information about this as well. And this is where a lot of our kind of work coalesced around. This is the old motor estate in South Manchester. This is a map of it. Uh, and what was interesting for us here was the combination, if you like, of a spatial analysis where people lived, how they lived their lives in a special way, and the social analysis of how people felt, what they did with their lives and so on. Uh, and this has uh, led to a whole series of innovations in terms of the built environment, social groups, and the development of this idea of a naturally a retirement community, or NORC for short. Uh, and this has really been the model, I think, that we've tried to develop in Manchester, and you might want to find out a little bit more. And the, the, the people who developed this for us are developing the three Manchester areas. Yeah, OK. So this is the last uh, slide I just wanted to refer to. And this was a paper written by uh, Tina and Chris with a little bit of uh, help from uh, a few other people. Uh, and this was really about trying to address what are the, address what are the key success features for age-friendly city programmes and although I should know this off by heart now I'll just have to step back a little bit to remind myself oh yeah okay so political leadership is and support is key now John mentioned in his presentation that you know we, we take a kind of low key approach to developing this work I hadn't quite got that message so I've been tweeting about this and mentioning this programme everywhere I go so I'll need to slightly recalibrate my approach to that but it seems to me that political leadership for us is key and part of the hub's job and part of our job individually and collectively is to really pitch this work and explain how this work can make a big difference uh, to the city, to Greater Manchester. That we need a team of people supporting this work and you've got in this room uh, a fantastic team of people uh, at, the, at the core but also across uh, all the different areas. Um, that we need a local narrative that agencies and residents understand and that's realistic. And certainly that's, again, something that we need and we work with our comms uh, colleagues to really design the messages that people understand. And there are a number of different audiences from policymakers, politicians, local residents. It needs to be 
a narrative that's realistic and which anticipates and understands people's everyday uh, lives. That we mean to mainstream ageing across all the different uh, partners that we work with and we promote this citizenship perspective rather than a deficit model. And last but no means least that we develop a partner strategy, this community of interest which brings together world-class research, um, leading policy makers, practitioners and of course older people in delivering this program over the next five years. So we have a fantastic opportunity I think uh, and uh, uh, I'd certainly as from a personal point of view see this as being a huge step change, a huge step forward for us in developing a really really impressive piece of work across all our communities uh, in Greater Manchester. So thank you very much. <laughs>